Hello again. Welcome to another episode of Leading from Alignment with our good friend, coach, and mentor, John Opaluski, and a special guest. John, how are you today? Hey, Jim. I'm doing great. It's good to be with you. And I'm super excited to have Craig Owens back with us. Yeah. He was with us in pod 153. Uh, Craig uh, uh, is a pastor of a wonderful church here in Michigan. He co-hosts a leadership podcast, and I love the name of it, The Craig and Greg Show. Uh, is a, a, a an accomplished blogger and uh, has published a wonderful book entitled Shepherd Leadership, uh, The Metrics That Really Matter. Craig, thank you for joining us uh, again for uh, another pod. Oh, I love the first conversation. So let's keep it going. All, all right. right. right well, it's interesting. Well, We're all wearing the same clothes as last week. It's just weird. Yeah. The coincidence. How that well, works, that happens. You know? Yeah. I'm really sure. So, Craig, um, could you, uh, for just a few minutes, give us a recap of Pod 153? Uh, I'm especially uh, interested in the the idea that we we were discussing at the end of 153. This idea mm -hmm. of this balancing act mm -hmm. uh, that leaders need to engage with. And we, we talk specifically about chapter four of your book um, around the adjustments that confident leaders need to make. Can you, can you recap that part of, uh, of the podcast for us, please? Sure. You know, I, um, to me, I, I like to look at it more as a a healthy tension. I, I think that that yeah, confidence like and that. humility should be really, uh, you know, balancing each other. We're all wired specifically by God. Some people are wired a little bit more confidently. Some people are wired a little bit more humbly. And I think that the confident person, what we talked about last time is that one of the things we have to be aware of is that we can play so much to that God-given strength that we end up taking it out of God's hands. And we're just using that strength, playing to that strength. And it's very important for us to be around healthy people, coaches, mentors. It's very important for us to be uh, aware of circumstances that the Holy Spirit may be using to speak to us. I think it's very important for us to be praying that search me prayer from Psalm 139 so that we can say, okay, I've, I've gone too far. My, my confidence now has become unhealthy in my leadership and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me balance that with the proper amount of humility. Yeah. It, it's almost like confidence could turn into hubris, right? Mm -hmm. If we're not, if we're not yeah. reliant and humble and, and dependent on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I know, I, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead <coughs> oh, me? Okay. I was going to say, yeah. you know, so confidence, you know, it is, it is so attractive because somebody that's confident can say, here's the way, let's go, guys, I'm blazing a trail, come on along with me. Yeah. And it naturally gathers followers, mm -hmm. which then kind of, I think, can lead to the hubris, because then you can start saying, hey, look how good I am, that I got all this uh, following, and I've got direction, and I've got people moving in this way. And so that's where it can um become the very unhealthy uh, hubris, like you said, um, because the confidence just naturally gathers the support of people. Hmm. I teach my young staff, you know, if, you, if, if you're in a moment where a decision has to be made, or you're not quite sure what the right decision is, even if you're not confident, it, it's okay to be confident in, in your position as a leader. You know, mm -hmm. we're, there's a tornado warning. What do we do? I, I, I don't know, but do something. You're the leader. You know, there's a, there's a problem in the parking lot. What do we do? I don't know, but but do it. And whatever decision you make, I'll stand behind you in the end, even if it's the wrong decision, I'll, I'll back you up on it. But then you and I will have a teaching moment afterwards. And I, I think, I think just like overconfidence can create a problem. So can humility, right? Yes. I mean, humility, mm -hmm. we can be so humble. We lead no one. We serve no one. We, we help no one, but you know, we're just, we're so meek and we're so mild that yeah, I, I learned this, that if there is a leader in the room, whether they're in charge or not, if there's a void of leadership, that leader will really be tempted to jump in yes. and take over. Yeah. And we've all seen the the board dynamic where there's a kind of a humble pastor and, a, and an arrogant deacon and the church becomes deacon possessed because mm -hmm. there's one guy that has meetings outside of the meeting or the one really strong personality kid takes over the youth group or the one, you know, the lady that has the key to the organ. You can't make any changes until she's you know, an organ donor 10 years from now because there's no... There's no way to, to make changes. So 
there is a balance, right? Humility doesn't mean I'll just wait for everybody else to, to eat first. There's something else. So what's, explain to us what you call the double-edged sword of humility. Well, I, I like one of the things that really helped me was the C.S. Lewis quote that said that humility is not thinking less of myself, it's thinking of myself less. And so yeah. that's really, I, I think that uh, the the overly confident person tends to think a lot of themselves. The overly humble person yeah. tends to da- downgrade themselves. And yeah. right. you have to remember that that uh, the the phrase that I like to remember is that God chose me. And so there's the confidence in the knowing the fact that God chose, but there, there's also the humility in the fact that he chose me of all the people that he could pick, you know, yeah. why, why would he pick me? And so I, I think yeah. that's where the, the humility can be very uh, attractive and very strong, but like you talked about, and you did say demon, a uh, deacon possessed, right? Deacon now, possessed. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just yeah. wanted to clarify yeah. that because <laughs> the, there might be another word in there that uh, would be very apropos as well, but the, the overly humble person can just say, oh, well, you know, I guess my skills my are not that important. Let me just fade back here and I'll let other people do what they want to do. That's unhealthy. And, and I don't think that that's God honoring, but right. the flip side to say, you know, I'm the one who has all the answers because I'm the leader. Um, that that one is uh, also right. not God honoring or healthy. You know, Craig, yeah. I, Brian, go ahead, Jim, and then I've got a thought. You no, know, I just uh, yeah, I just think that that Moses is described as the meekest, hmm. you know, the most humble man. But we also have to remember the book in which he's called the most humble man he wrote. So there's a right there. There's this dichotomy yes. of it was true. He can say this because it's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he's not making himself something he's not, but he's not diminishing something he is. I, you know, I am the most humble man <laughs> who ever lived. But I think he knew that because I am the most dependent upon Yahweh uh, of any man on earth. Um, right on. So, and so I, I think there is a balance to be a humble leader. You don't need to scream if you're right. You don't, yes. you don't need to invoke your own power. If you have God's power, you you can, you know, there's a, there's a balance there, right? I love that. I love that statement of humility is, you know, just thinking of yourself less. It's mm-hmm. not self-demeaning. It's remembering right. your role in the community. Yes. Go ahead, John. And, and Greg, I'm going to ask you uh, to help us find the, the middle, um, mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle between confidence and humility in just a second. But I, I wanted to just push up one last thought here on this being being humble in a way that's detrimental. Um, I've been involved in a meeting or two where a leader, a lead pastor specifically, has come into the room with a group of leaders, and we are doing visioning work together. And uh, he says, I don't really know where we're going. Where do you guys think we should go? Hmm. Or I, I want this to be uh, you know, and we believe in shared vision, obviously, but it's our sense that the leader, the lead pastor has to be the leader. Of, I mean, he has to have uh, the, uh, the onus of that vision and bring other people along to help fill it out and fine tune it and things like that. But I've actually sat in meetings where a lead pastor has said that. Mm-hmm. And it was like one of the worst meetings I've ever been involved in. It was just a free for all. Can yeah. you comment on that real quick before you answer my other question? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, and I agree. I, I think that that especially vision casting is not a multi-headed monster, um, and getting input from everybody on you know and trying to incorporate all incorporate all of that. I I sometimes will draw it as um, a big arrow. And then have some smaller arrows there inside. You know. And so there's there's some people that, hey, I'm with you on the main point, but I there's there's a little one here, you know, and, and maybe there's an opportunity for us to start this ministry over here. Or, well, okay, as long as it's fitting in the the whole goal, and right. and that that does take some confidence again to know to say, hey, God picked me for this role on purpose. Right. He he knew what skills that I had. But again, it's not saying that I have all of the answers, but I think that the initial vision direction has to be from God to one point leader, and then you bring in other leaders uh, to help support that. Yeah, appreciate that thought. Um, so so back to my, the question I, I kind of queued up earlier, 
Uh, I like to, I guess when I look at um, a lot of things in life, I, I look at extremes and then I, I want to find the middle. So mm -hmm. uh, for an example, we talk a lot about uh, workaholism and laziness. Where's the, both of those extremes being equally damaging to you and your health. How do you find the middle? How do you get there? And, and when it comes to the middle ground, between confidence and humility, how can we locate that, Craig? I mean, school us, mentor us on that on that question. I, I don't know that there ever is a perfect balance. I, I and that's why I like the idea of tension. That that right. almost like a tether. That if I'm naturally confident, that my humility is pulling me back to keep that confidence from going too far, and vice versa. That. Uh, the, by humility. And so that's why I, I will often interchange the terms and say, it's a humbly confident leader, or it's a confidently humble leader. Um, th th I think you got to have those, those two uh, dynamics in there. But um, I, I think that if I'm wired to be more confident, that's where I'm always going to naturally go. It's not never going to be all right, I'm perfectly balanced. And, and it's going to have to be this, this constant adjustment. And that's okay. I, I mean, I, I've I've heard, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but like, you know, a plane that's flying across the country that it's technically off course more than it's on course, you know, even with autopilot, you know, there's just those constant micro adjustments to get yeah. it to the, the proper location. And I, I think that God does the same thing with us if we're if we're open, that there'll there'll be that constant, you know, that pull of that tension back and forth. I need right. a little bit more confidence. I need a little bit more humility. That's interesting because that's balance, right? I, when I stand up, it may look like I'm standing still, but I'm really not. There's mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of muscles, right? Probably in an in internal, you know, balance system. And I, I, I don't know. I'm out of balance until I'm so far out of balance that I have to take a step to catch myself. And right. maybe, maybe there's some similarities there as well. But when you find yourself having to catch yourself in the same areas over and over again, then maybe John's question is answered. You know, yeah. how do I stay in the middle? Like, well, you're comfortable there. And, right. and if there's something out of balance, then a loving God gives us the ability to feel pain. So we know something's wrong. So we right. can do something about it. Take action. Yeah. I, I got a, I got a question. Go ahead, you know, John. Go ahead, John. <laughs> um, yeah, real quick. Sorry, we're kind of stepping on each other a little bit today. Um, so, Craig, what would you say to a, a leader who's really frustrated with this? You know, where they feel like I, I like they're ping ponging, you know, between mm -hmm. those two extremes, and and they 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 ask themselves this question: Am I ever going to get this right? Sure. What would you What would you say to them? Well, the first thing that I would say is you are in a great place in the fact that you're feeling frustrated by this, because mm -hmm. most of the people that get carried away with either being overly confident or overly humble, they don't realize it. They aren't uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to make them aware of that. So the very fact that somebody's saying, I'm frustrated by this process um, tells me that they're sensitive to the Holy Spirit that's saying, hey, you're out of alignment here and you need to come back. So that would be my first word of encouragement to somebody right. is it's a good thing that you feel the frustration there. But I think then the next thing is just there, there's going to be have to, we can build things into our life. Um, you know, I, I tell a story in, in the book from um, when I worked at the camp when we'd have children's camp come in, I discovered real quickly that, um, you know, these younger kids kind of fifth grade and under don't really know how to use a public bathroom correctly. Um, and so it was pretty disgusting. And my staff did not like, I, we had to put them on roving patrols the entire day, all week long, cleaning the bathrooms. And so that, you know, is not something that I relish doing either, but I just really felt the Holy Spirit saying to me that, you need to take this role on. And so I would do it without letting anybody know. I just, I'd go to bed early and then I'd get up in the middle of the night and load up my golf cart with all my cleaning supplies. And I'd make the rounds to all of the restrooms. And I would take care of the really gross things um, for my team. There were a lot of times that I'd walk in and want to come up with the excuse of, Hey, I'm the director of the camp. I'm not a housekeeper. I'm going to leave this one or that thing looks so bad. I'm going to have to call maintenance. I'm not going to, but I would force myself. I would say, and so the way I had to do it was 
I, I created an ultra ego superhero character that I called Plunger Man, and I'd have to make a game out of it to make myself go in there. And so I, I think that we can build things in. And on the same th- side, if we tend to be more humble, I think that there's things that we can put in um, to remind ourselves hey, I, I need to be confident that God has placed me here. Maybe it's a journal entry. Maybe it's a note right on your computer that you see it every time that you open it up or yeah. that sort of thing. But then also just build in the ongoing uh, dialogue with a, a good friend, a coach, a mentor that can say, hey, you're doing better. Why don't you talk, uh, look at tweaking this? Or I've noticed this. If you're open to it, maybe you could try. And that will help us uh, find that place where that tension is becoming not so extreme one way or the other. And then I think that the frustrations start to go away. Wow. I, I tell you what I've gotten out of that last five minutes is there's, there's two good reasons why I don't want to be a camp director. Number one <laughs> and number two. Yeah. Well, those, those are the two good reasons why I don't want to be a camp director. Whew, bless your heart. If there's a good neighborhood in heaven, you're living in it, brother. Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> hey, here, here's, here's a fun question that I think is, is self-analytical, but I think everyone will relate to your answer. If you could get in a time machine and have a conversation with yourself, a much younger version hmm. of yourself, what, what, what advice would you give to you that would have served you well all these years since? I, I think one of the big ones for me that it, it took me a while to, to grasp the Romans 8.28, that God is hmm. using all things yeah. to accomplish his purpose. And, and, uh, and I think there was a lot of places in my life that I didn't get the lessons that I needed because I said, ah, you know, I'm not sure why I'm here. I'm not sure where I'm going through this. Let, let's just yeah. try to get through it. And I wasn't really getting things out of it. That would probably be the biggest right. thing that I'd go back to tell myself is these experiences, they're not going to seem to make sense at the moment, but get something out of it, anything that you can, because down the road, there is going to be a lesson that you're going to be able to apply later. Right. John, what about you? Go back in time. What would you, what, mm-hmm. similar thing, something different? Yeah, well, I I have a laundry list, I think, of things I would tell myself. Um, I would tell the younger version of myself that um, your value is not in what you do. Mm-hmm. It's in who you belong to. And never forget that. Ne- never forget that your identity is an adopted son or daughter of Jesus Christ, that you're valuable because you belong to him. You're not valuable because you're skilled. Uh, And and I would tell myself not to look from the ministry, look for something from the ministry that only God can give to me. And that's that that lasting sense uh, of value. So I I think I I would tell myself that repeatedly. Yeah. What, what liberty there is in knowing that, right? That I, it's, it's whose I am. Yeah, I'm working yeah. from something. You know, Craig, I, I have one question. We don't have this on the list. And so if I throw, if this one throws you off, just say, John, I don't want to answer that. We'll just okay. go on. Um, but I'm wondering what you think about the relationship of pain mm. with how God uses us, you know, and, and what I would specifically mean there is the relationship of pain in our past and the doors that God seems to open for us in our present. Sure. Can you speak to that? I know that's a total curveball, but it just occurred to me while you were sharing a minute ago. Well, um, I, um, I can speak to that because um, I did not realize the value of pain and the empathy that you mm-hmm. learn through that uh, and, yeah. uh, until my very first pastorate. And this is actually where I met Jim um, was because the church that I was pastoring was not too far away. And mm-hmm. um, I was there for 17 excruciating months. And um, at the time, I, I mean, I I felt myself circling the drain. I, I, I could mm-hmm. sense that I was right on the edge of becoming clinically depressed if I wasn't maybe even already there. And um, that's why uh, frequently I had to call up Jim and say, I I just need to kind of vomit. I got to get some stuff out because I can't Mm -hmm. keep it all in. And um, I needed to to walk through that. And it was very hard for me at that time. Um, 
I remember leadership in our district saying to me, because they came in and sat in on a meeting, and after all these angry people had just spewed their venom and then they left, they looked at me and they said, do you want to be here? And I said, "I no, I don't, but God called me here and I don't feel like he's released me. And so mm-hmm. now they want to fire me as you know the, the pastor, that would be one thing. But it it probably took me another two or three years after that before I encountered somebody who was going through a similar situation and they thought that they were all by themselves. Yeah. And when I could come in and say, you're feeling this and this and struggling with this and watch their eyes pop open. How did you know? I, I've walked through that dark valley. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I've, I've learned that I, I don't think I knew it before then that there were lessons that I could learn through painful experiences that I couldn't learn any other way. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't really want to, uh, you know, walk through that again. I, I wouldn't wish it on an enemy uh, to walk through that, but I also wouldn't trade that experience for the lessons that I learned on the other side of it. Oh, that's so good. And and I, I think there might be leader or two listening or watching to this podcast today that's in pain. Mm-hmm. And uh, we want to encourage you that the the pain you're facing right now is not without purpose and um, that God is the the master at taking the painful things in our life and turning them into something beautiful and life-giving if we'll just cooperate with him. Yes. So we would just say to you, I think all three of us would say the same thing, just cooperate with God. If you're in pain, get help, reach out to somebody who's safe, who's competent, Mm -hmm. Uh, who can walk alongside you. And um, I believe that with all of my heart that God uses the most painful things in our life to set us up for our most productive ministry. Yes. Yeah. And that's biblical, John, you know, second Corinthians chapter one, right? Praise be to the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we've received. So who better to help somebody through addiction than someone who's been through addiction? Who, who better to help somebody through depression than someone I, I, you call it the dark valley? I believe it was, you know, Craig. Yeah. But that's a, a beautiful description of that. It's um, we don't know how long valleys last, especially in the dark. But if you have somebody that's been through this place before, it's helpful. And I, as we kind of close out our time, I think it's where we are right now, John. Is that right? We kind of yeah, yeah, we're bumping line. up. You know, I asked you guys the question: What what would you tell your younger self? And this is, may sound insincere or self-serving. I hope it doesn't. I hope people know me better than that. I would have gotten smarter, better, older, uh, wiser people in my life much sooner. I would have quit Mm -hmm. pretending because I had a big youth group that I was a big youth pastor. I would have found fathers. I would have found professors. I would have educated myself much better than I I did. And, And I would have been ongoing in my pursuit of wholeness, of health, so, you know, me at 22 running into you, John, today, and you say, what's that one thing? You say, man, I, I wish I wish I could have told me it's all going to be okay, that God knows what he's doing, that, yeah. you know, that you are who you are, regardless of what you do. I, that, that's, I wish 22-year-old Jim knew that. Mm. And so as we close our time together, I, I hope, again, this doesn't sound like, so, you know, press that button and keep those cards and letters coming. That's not what this is. Like, legitimately. Yeah. Having wise people in your life is biblical. Yeah. Those who yes. walk with the wise will become wise. And, and who are the wise? They're the people that have probably made the most foolish mistakes in the past mm. and have been taught by others or by God through pain, through humility, through all the things we've been talking about for the last two weeks. To have that father, to have that mother, to have that brother in your life, is it's everything. So um, in a way, that's hard to find. Because if you're wrestling with something that is hard to say as someone's pastor or someone's spouse or someone's father, you need a third party disconnected from those relationships that you can just be honest with. Like Craig called just vomiting. When, when Craig told me it was happening at his church, I wasn't his deacon. I wasn't his superintendent. I wasn't his parishioner. I was a safe third party that he could be honest with. And we would encourage you, whether it's Converge, whether it's getting a hold of Craig's book or getting a hold of Craig, um, you find smart people, find wise people. If, if they don't have scars, I don't trust them. Mm. <laughs> if, if their Bibles aren't marked up and dog-eared and highlighted, I don't trust them. If, if there isn't duct tape somewhere holding them together from, from a past that gives them a story. Tattoos are cool. Scars are cooler. 
because scars mean I actually did something. I, I didn't just commemorate something. So find, find the men, find the women, find the fathers, the mothers, spiritually in the body of Christ and be real and be honest. And if we can serve you in that way, then we, we certainly will. Craig's book, remind us again, Craig, the title of the book and where to find it. It's a shepherd leadership and real easy to find it at shepherdleadershipbook.com. Dot com. If we can be of assistance to you, let us know. Go to Converge Coach, go to Shepherd Leadership Book, and let's let's continue this conversation. And uh, we're cheering for you. We're praying for you. We're rooting for you. And we are believing that God has something really wonderful that he's doing with the recipe of your life. Yes. And chocolate chip cookies have flour, lard, you know, uh, baking soda. But they also have brown sugar and chocolate chips. It doesn't. It isn't until it all comes together and goes through a process that a cookie comes out. So if you got a mouthful of lard today, man, we get it. We've been there. But remember, it is part of the recipe. So God bless you as you continue to serve, as you continue to walk in humility, and, and in the grace that God's put on your life, and as you continue to lead from alignment.